So if we had these conditions uh, where we had our p-value of our Shapiro-Wilk test for normality equals 0 0.03 and our sample size is 17, we would not be able to conduct the one sample Z test with this data set. And we'd have to look for a different type of analysis to analyze our data. Uh, so our last assumption is that our sample is randomly selected. It's a little tricky with one sample Z test because we're dealing with a sample and a population. Um, so to meet this assumption, it means that we randomly selected our sample from the population of interest. So in this example, we wanted to see if our uh, sample of NBA players was significantly uh, taller than the entire population of biological males. So if we were looking at this assumption, random selection would mean that every member of the population had an equal chance of being selected into our sample. So for this example, that would mean that every NBA player would have had an equal chance of being selected into our sample, which is not true because we used a convenient sample. So if you're thinking, well, then we violated uh, the random selection assumption, you're correct, okay? So if you do not randomly select your sample, you violate this assumption like we did in that example. However, the one sample Z test is robust to the violation of this assumption. We don't try to generalize our results from our sample back to the population of interest. So here where we're comparing our sample of NBA players to uh, the entire population of biological males, um, here we would say that we, we can't actually generalize this to all NBA players. We can only talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. You'd also write this in the limitation section of the discussion section of your research manuscript. So like we've learned all along, statistics falls within research design. It's, it's one portion of our research manuscript that we have when we are doing science. All right, so here you can see this table that I created um, that has all of the assumptions listed. Uh, it also has the robust, robust to violation of assumption uh, category as well. So when you're going through and doing this for yourself, uh, I typically like to look at it in these, this order. So I would first check, is our dependent variable measured on a scale? If it's yes, you're good. You don't have to look at the robust rule. So if it's yes, you say yes. Uh, and then you move on to the next assumption. So it says data set is free of outliers based off of the plus or minus 3.29 Z-score criterion for the supposed of dependent variable. So if, it, if you see that none of your C scores are 3.29 or higher, or negative 3.29 or smaller, uh, then you meet this and you'd move on to check the next assumption. However, you violate this assumption, you move over to the robust, uh, to the violation of the assumption column, and you would see, okay, well, if we remove these, we can still do this analysis anyway. So it would be robust. Then you would go and check the next assumption. Uh, the sample came from a normally distributed population. We use that Shapiro-Wilk test for normality. Um, so if our p-value is greater than or equal to 0 0.05 for our Shapiro-Wilk test, then we're good to go and we can move on to the next assumption. However, if it's less than 0 0.05, then we need to move to the robust column here. And we see if our sample size is 30 or larger that we're still good to run the analysis. And then we move into our last one uh, that we select our sample from the population of interest using random selection. If we, if we did that, then great, and we can Go ahead and continue with our analysis. If not, um, we just know that we cannot generalize the results of this study um, to the overall population we're interested in studying. Okay, so step four then would be to calculate the test statistic. So every analysis that we do has a test statistic that's associated with it. Every different one, so this is the one sample Z test, will have its own formula that will plug uh, our data set into so that we can solve for whatever this test statistic is. So in this case, our test statistic is trying to tell us how big the difference between our sample mean is and our population mean is. Okay. So our formula for this one, uh, it's going to only have part of it because this is the easier way to see it, but we see our Z equals, in our numerator we have X bar minus mu. So we have our sample mean minus our population mean divided by our SEM. So to get the SEM, what we do is we take the population standard deviation, then we divide it by the square root of our sample size. Okay. So let's learn about this. So we know previously that we used the symbol lowercase italicized Z to represent Z score. This is also gonna be the symbol for our test statistic for our one sample Z test. 
And then SEM um, is the standard error of the mean. So if you want to go ahead and put that into your handy dandy symbol sheet, capital S, capital E, capital M. Uh, and then we will have that as the standard error of the mean. So go ahead and do that right now. Pause me. So our formula again for SEM is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. And so stay with me for a little bit. Let's talk about what this means. The SEM is the standard deviation of all potential sample means from the overall population. Okay. So in other words, finding our SEM, um, if we were gonna do this long drawn out way, we could take every possible sample of the same size from the overall population. Okay. Then we'd write the mean of each of those samples down. Then we would take the standard deviation, we would find the standard deviation of all of those means to see about how much they vary from one another. And we would get the SEM. But instead, scientists came up with this formula um, so that you wouldn't have to go through all of that. So let's say like you had a population of 6 million, right? And you had to find every possible combination of a sample size of 10. And then once you got all of those different types of samples, you could find the mean of the mean from each of those samples of 10. And then you'd have to find the standard deviation of all those means. That is a long drawn out process. Most of the time, we're not gonna have access to the entire population individual data points. Um, but instead, um, what researchers found if you take the population standard deviation, you divide it by the square root of the sample size that you're examining, it will give you um, that same value. Okay, so the formula, let's revisit this then. Now that we know the SEM is a type of standard deviation for every possible sample mean, let's look at the formula again. Okay, so now that we see this formula where we have our one sample Z test equals the mean of the sample minus the mean of the population divided by the standard deviation for every possible sample mean, the one sample Z test is essentially a form of what? So if you look at this formula, what does it look like something that we've done in the past? Now that we know SEM is a type of standard deviation. It looks like our Z-score formula. And so what we're looking here is to see about how far apart is our sample mean from our population mean in the units of standard deviation. Okay. So that's the formula we had for our Z-score, X minus X bar divided by standard deviation. So essentially we're finding a z-score for our samples mean. And so if it's big enough, if it's enough SEMs away from our population mean, um, then we might be able to say that they're significantly different from one another. Okay, step five then, we're gonna find our critical value or values. This is using that uh, area under the curve or our z-critical value table that we used when we were solving the problems for area under the curve. So finding our critical values. And with one sample z-test, it's actually a lot easier uh, than what it will be when we move on in some of the different statistical analyses in the future. Uh, so when we're doing our hypothesis testing steps, we calculated our test statistic using that formula. And we're going to compare that test statistic to our critical values. And this will help us make a decision. All right, so our symbol for critical value is going to be capital C, capital V. So go ahead and put that on your symbol sheet right now. To say the critical value of a particular test, a lot of times we'll use CV as subletters to whatever test statistic that we're doing. So in this unit, we're using the one sample Z test. Um, so our symbol is going to be Z sub CV. And so later on in our, our next step, actually, we're going to draw out a normal curve and we're going to label our critical value. We're going to label the center zero because we know in the middle a uh, z-score is zero if your x is falling on the mean. Um, we're also gonna label the different decisions that we can make with relation to our null hypothesis. And this will be a really easy way for us to know what decision that we're making in step six. Okay, so if you wrote non-directional hypotheses, you're gonna have two critical values. That's because you'll be running a two-tailed test. When we're talking about hypotheses, we either say directional or non-directional. When we're talking about the test that we're running, we use one-tailed test or two-tailed test. 
Okay, so again, when we use non-directional hypotheses, we have two critical values because we're running a two-tailed test. If you wrote a directional hypothesis, you would have one critical value. And that's because you're running a one-tailed test. Okay, so finding our critical values of z, um, you're gonna use that z table, in other words, the area under the curve table um, to find your critical value or critical values. Uh, in the area under the curve table, if you remember, there was three, there were three columns. When we're finding the Z critical value, we're interested in the Z value, the Z column, and the area beyond Z column. All right, so finding the Z critical value for an alpha level of 0.05. Okay, so our alpha level, and this is something that's pretty confusing because if you Google it, a lot of times you're going to get a wrong answer, but our alpha level is the risk we're willing to take that if we reject our null hypothesis, um, the null hypothesis is actually true, okay? Um, so with our data set that we have, we're going to make a decision. Um, that decision may not actually be correct, um, and so we have this threshold that we're going to use that will compare um, well, if we had a p-value, we would compare a p-value to um, to see what the probability is that we're going to make something called a type 1 error. So if we convert our alpha level to 0.05 into a percentage, we see that we're okay with make the probability of making a type 1 error up to 5%. So if we wrote our hypothesis direction, the entire 5% goes on one side uh, in one tail. If we wrote our hypotheses non-directionally, that means we're conducting a two-tailed test. This means we'll split our 5% in half. So we'll have two and a half on one side and two and a half on the other. Okay, this means the proportion of the data in each of our tails for the two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0.05 will be 0 0.0250. Okay, so finding a critical value for a two-tailed test to use the area under the curve table, split your alpha in half. If our alpha level is 0.05, that means for a two-tailed test that there will be 0 0.0250 in each tail. So to find the z-score associated with an area beyond z of 0 0.0250, what would we do? We would look for the area beyond z of 0 0.0250, and you'd find the corresponding z-score. Go ahead and do that now. Okay, so this is just a visual of what we would do there. Okay, so if we look here and we look for an area beyond Z of 0 0.0250, what Z score is associated with that? Here we see a Z score of 1.96. Okay, and we know that in our critical value tables that we only have positive numbers. So if we are running a two-tailed test and we have a critical value of 1.96, we know that's plus or minus. So on one side, it would be positive 1.96. And then on the other side, it would be negative 1.96. Okay, so then finding our critical value um, for our Z test, or finding our Z critical value for one-tailed test. Um, we have to identify whether our critical value will be negative or if it'll be positive. This comes in how you worded your research hypothesis. So if you said that your sample mean would be significantly larger than your population mean, your critical value will be positive. If you said that your sample mean is significantly less than your population mean, then your critical value will be negative. Okay, and that's just something that you'll have to memorize. Um, and it can be slightly confusing, but uh, the more you do it, the more practice that you get, the better you'll get at it. Um, since we decided to run a one-tailed test for a directional hypothesis, all 5% will go in one tail. Okay, so if we see here um, where I labeled the normal curve, we see that all 5% goes into one tail. Um, if we had a negative critical value go on the other side as we see here. So our area under the curve table, here we'd be looking for area beyond Z of 0 0.0500. And then what do you see when we try to look for that in here? 
here we see they actually don't have a z-score that's associated with it exactly, that we have 1.64, um, which has an area beyond z of 0 0.0505, and then a z-score of 1.65 has a z-score of 0 0.0495. Um, so you could use a z-critical uh, z value of 1.645 for one-tailed test with that alpha level of 0 0.05, and that's really probably what I would do. So what if our alpha level equaled 0 0.01? What if we only wanted a 1% chance that we were going to make a type 1 error? We would find the critical values exactly the same way. Typically in this class, we'll use an alpha level of 0 0.05 almost always, uh, unless I direct you otherwise. So if it's a one-tailed test, what portion of the data would fall beyond Z? It would be 0 0.01. So then you would use the Z-score that's associated with the area beyond Z of 0 0.0100. So you'd go in the area under the curve table, you'd look at the area beyond Z of 0 0.0100, and then you would go to the Z-score that's associated with it. If it's a two-tailed test, what proportion of the data would fall beyond Z? So remember, we have to split it in half so that we have half of it on one side and half on the other. If you said 0 0.0050, you are correct. So to find the critical value, you'd find the Z-score associated with an area beyond Z of 0 0.0050. Step six, then we're gonna make a decision. And to do this, we're always gonna label our normal curve. Um, if we wrote our hypothesis non-direction, our, our normal curve will have two tails on it. If we wrote our hypothesis directionally, then it'll just have one tail on it, and either it'll be on the positive side or the negative side, depending on how you wrote your research hypothesis. You'll need to label critical value or values, your test statistic value, the reject the null hypothesis region or regions, and the retain the null hypothesis region. Okay, so this is what it would look like. So um, with the one sample Z test, our critical values always stay the same. Um, and this is the only analysis that we're gonna learn this semester where it's like that. So if we have a two-tailed test and alpha level 0 0.05, for one sample Z test, our critical values will be positive 1.96 and negative 1.96. So we'll see here that we have zero in the middle. I always like to label it there so it can orient to us when we're trying to make our decision. Um, you're going to see that the reject the null hypothesis will be in the tails of both sides when we're doing a two-tail test. In the middle, we have the retain the null hypothesis section. And so after you have this labeled, uh, once you have a test statistic value, you can go in and label where your test statistic will fall. So if we had a Z test statistic equal to two, you go down here and you would have Z equals two, and you would plot it on this little number line here. And you can see that if Z equals two, and if this is our alpha level, that we would reject the null hypothesis. If we had a Z test statistic equal to zero, we see that we retain our null hypothesis. So writing your results. Um, when you make your decision in this step, you will need to write your results out in words and in symbols. In words, your decision will either be reject the null hypothesis or retain the null hypothesis. If you reject your null hypothesis, that means that your null hypothesis is not an accurate explanation for what's going on with your data set and that we think believe there are significant differences. If you retain the null hypothesis, uh, we believe that there's not a big enough of a difference between the two means that it, it didn't happen by chance. So typically when people write results in research studies, they write the symbols or the results out in symbols. And that's the main reason that people really struggle um, to understand the results sections in journals, I believe. Um, again, this is usually what scares students the most when reading research, but it follows the template. And by the time you get out of this, this class, even if you don't know all of the statistical analyses, you should be able to interpret what they're saying uh, based off of the template that we have. So if we write our results in symbols for significant results, we'd have Z, which says we did a one sample Z test equals whatever value we calculated with the one sample Z test formula. Um, if we had significant results, we have our P, which represents P value or our probability of making a type one error. Notice we don't have that value. Our P value is associated with our test statistic. Um, and then we have less than our alpha level, which is 0 0.05, remembering that is 
um, what we'll always use in this class, unless I direct you otherwise. So we're saying our probability of making a type one error is less than our alpha level of 0.05. Um, and then we have a comma, you'll see a lowercase d, and um, that represents a Cohen's d, which we haven't learned yet because it's follow the analysis equals, and then whatever value you got from that formula. Okay, so z is a symbol for the test statistic that we ran. The two in this is the test statistic value that you calculated in step five. Step four, our p equals our p value which is our probability of making a type one error if we reject the null hypothesis with the data set that we have. If our decision was to reject the null hypothesis, we'll include this less than sign. 0 0.05 is our alpha level. Um, we know that there are two most commonly accepted alpha levels, 0 0.05 and 0 0.01. He represents Cohen's D, which is a follow-up analysis you conduct if you had significant results. In other words, if you reject your null hypothesis in step six, um, then there will be some follow-up analyses that you need to conduct. And then the 0.35 is that Cohen's D value that you calculate in step seven. So if we retain the null hypothesis, that means we have non-significant results. Uh, and there's a way to write that in symbols as well. So here we see Z equals 1.07 comma, P equals n dot s dot. So the z here is the symbol for the test statistic that we ran, in this case, the one sample z test. And the 1.07 here is the test statistic value that we calculated in step four. And we have our p, which is our p value, our probability of making a type one error if we reject the null hypothesis with the data set that we have. Equals. So if our decision was to retain the null hypothesis, you'll write the equal symbol. And you write n dot s dot, which means not significant. So a two-tailed test with the alpha level of 0 0.05 and a z equal to 2.50. So if you're using a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0 0.05 and your z test equals 2.50, what decision would you make? So look here um, where I have it all plotted out on the normal curve. What decision would we make? Here we would reject the null hypothesis. So again, for us to reject the null hypothesis, our test statistic value has to move beyond our critical value. So uh, if we remember from the area under the curve lesson, beyond means moving away from the mean. So here we see we want it to move beyond 1.96. So if it equals 1.96, then you would retain that null hypothesis. So you want it to move beyond it. Okay. So we would write the results out as reject the null hypothesis. And then in symbols, our results would look like this so far because we haven't learned to calculate Cohen C, which is our follow up analysis. And we'll just do the first portion of the results. So here we have z equals 2.50, comma, p is less than 0 0.05. If this is our results, we would need to move on to step seven. And right, so here's another example. If you're using a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0 0.05 and your z test statistic equaled 1.00, what decision would you make? Here you would retain the null hypothesis. Okay, so we'd write the results out in words as retain the null hypothesis. And then in symbols, our results would look like the following. V equals 1.00 comma P equals N dot S dot. Again, N dot S dot means not significant. In other words, our p-value, our probability of making a type 1 error, is greater than or equal to our alpha level, which is our cutoff. This means that there are not significant differences between the sample mean and the population mean. So our one-tailed test with alpha level 0 0.05 and a z equal to negative 1.00. As you see here that we would label our normal curve with retain the null hypothesis reject the null hypothesis, our critical value is what separates our two decisions. Um, here we see that our critical value is negative 1.645. We also label our test statistic value of negative one on there. And so let's write our results out in symbols and in words. 
So here we would retain our null hypothesis because our test statistic value did not move beyond our critical value. And if we write that in symbols, we have z equals negative 1.00, comma, our p value equals not significant, our n dot s. Dot. Okay, so if we hypothesize in our research hypothesis that the sample mean is significantly less than our population mean, then n dot s dot means that x bar is not significantly less than mean. Okay, so for this example, one tail test where alpha level equals 0 0.05 and our z equals negative 2.00, we would label a normal curve remembering to put each region, retain the null hypothesis, reject the null hypothesis, label our critical value, the zero in the middle, and then we label our test statistic value, which is negative two. So what decision will we make and how will we work that out in words? We'd write reject the null hypothesis. And then we would put that into symbols as well. Here we'd have z equals negative 2.00, comma, p is less than 0 0.05. If this is our result, then we need to move on to step seven so that we could calculate our cones d. All right, so then we have one tail test with our alpha level of 0 0.05 and our z value equaling 2.00. We have labeled retain the null hypothesis, reject the null hypothesis. We put our critical value um, and our test statistic value in the zero in the middle. What decision would we make here? Here we would reject our null hypothesis. And then when we wrote these in symbols, we would write Z equals 2.00 comma P is less than 0 0.05. All right, so then we have one tail test where alpha level is 0 0.05 and our z equals 1.60. Um, after we label our normal curve, what decision would we make? Here we would retain our null hypothesis. And then if we wrote that out in symbols, what would it look like? We would have z equals 1.60 comma p equals n dot s dot. If you hypothesize in your research hypothesis that the sample mean is significantly larger than the population mean, then n dot s dot means that the sample mean is not significantly more than the population. So final thoughts on making a decision. If you find statistically significant results, um, in other words, when your p-value is less than 0 0.05, remembering we're not actually going to calculate our p-value. Our p-value, our probability of making type 1 error, is associated with whatever test statistic value we have. Our alpha level of 0 0.05 is associated with our critical value. So instead of comparing our p-value to our alpha level, we're comparing our test statistic to that critical value. Uh, and so if when you go out into the real world, you actually will just type everything into the software and it'll actually spit out your p-value to you. Uh, and if your p-value is less than 0 0.05, you have statistically significant results. If it equals 0 0.05 or larger, then you have non-significant results or insignificant results. So if you find significant results where your p-value is less than 0 0.05, then you have to conduct follow-up analyses. If you find in insignificant results, where, you, in other words, where you retain your null hypothesis, you're done. Step seven, conduct follow-up analyses as needed. And for this, we'll do something called the effect size. And just because we find significant results in step six, all that's saying is that these differences, we don't believe they occur due to chance. It does not mean or tell you anything about how big those differences are. So in this step, if we find that we have statistically significant results, then we will move on to see how meaningful or how big those differences are. Okay, so effect size specifically helps us to see how much our distributions overlap. So what was a distribution again? If you said it's how frequently each value occurs in your data set, you're 100% correct. If not, um, that's going to be something you want to practice again. Um, so for the one sample Z test, we use Cohen's D. That's a very specific type of effect size that is not always going to be the effect size that we use, um, but it is definitely one of them. 
And our formula for this is lowercase d. So that's going to represent Cohen's d. You're going to want to put that on your symbol sheet right now. So lowercase italicized d equals Cohen's d equals x bar minus mu divided by lowercase sigma. So we're in this formula, we're looking at the sample mean minus the population mean in the numerator divided by the population standard deviation. No, if you do not have statistically significant results, you will not calculate an effect size. Okay, so writing results when you calculate an effect size, um, it used to be common that people would write the results without effect sizes. Um, that is no longer the case. What is one problem with this? When we find significant results, it just tells us the difference is big enough that it likely didn't occur the chance. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about how big that those differences were. So if our alpha, our alpha level is 0 0.05, we say there's a 95% chance that those differences uh, didn't occur because of error. So again, the effect size tells you how big these differences are. And therefore, um, from this point in history forward, actually for a while now, it is required to include Cohen's D in your results if they're significant for one sample Z test. So effect size guidelines. Um, so once you calculate it, you might want to know, okay, so what do these numbers mean? Um, if you have a small effect size, um, you have to get a 0 0.20 or larger is considered a small effect size. Once your Cohen's D gets to a 0 0.50, they consider that about a medium effect size. And then once you get to 0 0.80 and larger, they consider those large effect sizes. Okay, and that's all we have for this week. Um, there is a lot of information. Um, so feel free to pause and rewatch what you need. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to book office hours appointments. Um, we can always Google Meet or we can you can come in person as well. And I know it's a lot, so just uh, make sure you're breaking it up and that you're studying. And when I'm asking questions, try your best to answer them, um, even though nobody else is there. So I hope you have a great week and I'll see you next week.